they look very fierce. They look very awkward. They look very exotic. And sometimes they're very colorful, and they have a lot of faces, and they have fangs, and they're naked. Sometimes they're unique, they're consorts, they're consorts. Sometimes they have many heads, sometimes they're very simple, sometimes they're male, they're, they're, they're female. And the reason for that is, when you look inside them with us, psychologically, they're all the same. But they're safe from the side of their mind, they're all exactly the same. But, from their side, they're the same. They can change the colors, just like we have five, six classes of uh, glass. We have one is red, one is blue, one is yellow, one is purple. If we take the water, we put it in the blue one, the water looks blue. If we take the water out, we put it in the red one, the water looks red. Similarly, if we put it in the cup, it's the shape of a, a bottle, it looks like a bottle. If we put it in the cup, uh, that's the shape of a, a box, it looks like the shape of a box. But inside, the water essence is exactly the same. So, when we look at the deities of Tibetan Buddhism, they're actually with us. Well, most of them are with us. And what happens is, they have different colors, they have different shapes, they have different appearances, they have different arms, different heads. But the inside essence is exactly the same. Now, then you ask if they're the same, why do we just have one? Some people go along the world, and they travel along the world, and they're very lazy. They're very lazy, they don't want to learn, they don't want to push themselves, or they're very obscure or they're very tied down by the karma. And they say, oh, I want to make it simple. I just want to pray to the Buddha. Oh, I want to make it simple. I just want to pray to maybe uh, uh, Amitabha. And I just want to make it simple. It's not a matter of simplicity. If you say that, I want to make it simple, just pray to Buddha or Shakyamuni or whatever, then you put down Buddha's wisdom. Why? Buddha has emanated all these forms. Buddha has emanated so many forms of and so many people. So when you say, oh, I'm not interested in that, I'm not interested in that, I just want this, and I want to make it simple, you're putting down the Buddha. Why? It's not the Tibetan Lamas that create these deities. It's not the Indian Lamas that create these deities. It's the Buddha himself who emanated these forms. So Buddha will emanate as Amitabha, will emanate as Ponyin, will emanate as Manjushri, will emanate as Vajrapini, will emanate as Tara. Why? The reason they emanate in many colors and many forms. Colors has a very powerful psychological effect on our mind. Red color, green color, yellow color. In psychological studies, even in ancient India and currently now, if you if you change the color of the mood, it changes the mood of the person over time. We all know that colors really change our moods. For example, funerals in the West they wear black, in the East they wear white. You, they represent something. Black is mourning, white is purification. To go purely, to go with yourself, to pay respect. Similarly, the deities have different colors to affect our mind, psychologically. The psychological effect is to transform the mind into an ultimate state. For example, the green of Tara is for someone who's extremely miserly, manipulative, and very, very controlling in regards to wealth and money and resources and material items. So there are people out there who are very manipulative, very sneaky, very controlling, or very scared in regards to money, in relationship to money. So green is the color that has to do with miserliness, that has to do with the transformation of miserliness, that has to do with the transformation of this miserly energy into generosity. So in Buddhism, we're not trying to take that energy away. We're trying to transform that energy. So miserly energy, the other side of the coin is generosity. The other side of the coin is miserly. It's all the same coin, it's just two sides. So what we want to do is we want to make the generosity transform. Otherwise, if you want to take it out and replace it, that would mean that you have to replace the person's mind. That is an aspect of their mind. You cannot replace a person's mind. The mind is, has ultimate nature. So therefore, you're not taking a person's mind out, selfish mind, and putting a generous mind in. You're using the exact same mind to transform it into its higher quality. So that's very important to know. Therefore, the green color, the green color of Tara is a psychological color that when a person meditates on it, focuses on it, it has a psychological effect of transforming the person's incredible miserly energy or energy having to do with attachment to wealth or material objects. 
Okay, that's very, very powerful. Now, in the case of red, in the case of red, the most pervasive energy at this time in samsara, the most pervasive, not the only energy, and not the most work, I'm sorry, not the only energy, but the most pervasive energy that manifests now is sexual desire, sexual energy, and anything having to do with sexual desire. Example, even the way women dress today, and the way women dress 100 years ago is very different. Even the way men approach women is different now than it was 100 years ago. So my point is that sexual desire has always been the same from day one. From day one till now, from the first day of samsara to now, sexual desire has been the same. If it's not been the same, we will not be taking rebirth. Why? It is by sexual or it is by desire we take rebirth. So to say 500 years ago there was less uh, sexual desire and there is more now, that's wrong. But now the time for manifesting sexual desire is much stronger. So people are more willing to kill for sexual desire. People are more willing to do work for sexual desire. People are more willing to concentrate. If you look at the TV shows, it's always focusing on relationships. The ones that are most popular is about relationships. The breakage, the getting together, getting the new one. Why are so opposite, so drama, so exciting? They focus on who slept with who, who's with who, who separated who, who doesn't like who, who's wearing what, who's seducing who, who's suspected of seducing who, always is about that. And, and, and these shows run for 20, 30 years, nonstop. Even the actors are aged, like General Hospital and all that, all the beautiful, they are so aged already. But they're still using the same actors with a few new ones to spice it up. Why? What is it about? And how do they, what do the commercials run on? Even food products, they use some beautiful model there to insinuate sexual desire to buy the product. A piece of candy and a beautiful person has nothing to do with each other, but they make it in such a way that it, it taps into your sexual desire. I'm not saying that anyone here has more sexual desire or less sexual desire. No, this is very carefully. Everybody in this room, including me, everybody has the same amount of sexual desire. It's only how we manifest it. In this life, if we're born as a mute, as a retard, we're born retarded and we're not able to move or paraplegic. doesn't mean we don't have sexual desire, it just means we do something else. Why? We can't manifest it. We can't manifest it. If we're 15 or 14 or 10 or 12 years old, we have a great amount of sexual desire. It just cannot manifest because we're too young. Similarly, if you're elderly. Similarly, if you're in a culture that is more restrictive. Similarly, if you're in a culture that's more open. So. How strong we manifest our sexual desire, and how much we fight for it, how much we go for it, how much it brings happiness and unhappiness to us, is dependent on environmental condition. So the environmental condition that we are born into determines how much we can manifest a certain type of affliction or emotional disturbance. That doesn't mean we have one emotional disturbance less than another. We're equal to that. And it doesn't mean that just because in this life you're not very interested in sex, that you are less sexual. It just means that in this life, maybe you were born into a society or parents or people that it's not very, it's frowned upon. So you manifest maybe in anger or maybe money or in something else. So my point is, in this day and age, sexual desire is not more. Sexual desire is more allowed to manifest. There's a difference. Some people say, oh, sexual desire is much, much more now. I don't agree. Why don't I agree? When I study, when I've studied and I've checked the tantras out and I've read the commentaries and I thought about it, I said, no. If sexual desire was more now, we can debate. Why would it be more now? Where the same sentient beings go over going in samsara again and again and again? Why would our anger be more? Why would our sexual desire be more? Our anger would be more. It's just that we have a chance to manifest anger. So in this life, we're born as a king, we can be angry easier. And people would have to take it. But if we're born as a sweeper in a shopping mall, we won't have a chance to express our anger. People would just say, shut up. So every life is very, very different how we manifest. Similarly, today's world, the manifestation of anger the manifestation of desire is a more support system for them. Example, if you look at the reality shows, 
what do they play on? They play on people's emotions. They play on fighting. You know, American Idol, how the judges put down the contestants. And the contestants get angry and protest back and forth. That's reaction right there. So people want that. What am I saying is that anger is even glamorized. It's being made into money now. So anger has more of an easier outlet to manifest. But all of us have the same amount of anger that we had previously. Sexual desire also has the same, has more outlet. So today in the world, pervasively, sexual desire has the strongest manifestation outlet. So therefore, with that predictive, in the future, sexual desire will be a very powerful illusion that is allowed to open up easier than other illusions because of the environment conditions. He didn't predict that it will be more powerful sexual desire. It will be more easier. Why? We have more time, we have more energy, we have more technology to assist us in doing more negative energy, more negative actions. We have air conditioning, we have light, we have electricity that helps us to stay home and do nothing, and we, we can watch TV. Technology has helped us to increase our illusions. Technology outwardly makes things easier. Technology has made people lazy. Technology has made people manifest their desires and their difficulties more easier. So therefore, to counter this, to counter this, then Lord Buddha has manifested as Vajrayini. Why does Lord Buddha manifest as Vajrayini? Directly, the end incarnation is Hiruka. Directly. Directly, it's Hiruka. Hiruka's practice is very complicated and very long and very, very, very time consuming. For people of the past where there's not a lot of technology, there's not a lot of things to do. Once you go home from the fields, once you get into your room, there's nothing to do but study or meditate or do nothing and or sleep. How much can a person sleep? Even more condensed is found to be. Even more condensed. So today's, today, according to Kashi Palomar Rinchi, the great Yajimi book. The Yidam of today, the Yidam of the future, is what you mean. The Yidam of the future. This is his own words, his own prediction. And that he encouraged it. He encouraged the why. Kamaka Rinchi himself is a master of all chakras. Kala chakra, Hiruka, Guya Samaja. In fact, his holiness the Dalai Lama today is the greatest Buddhist master in the world. But his knowledge and his mastership came from somewhere. His mastership and his knowledge and his incredible wisdom came from his gurus. His gurus are Trijayaranji and Ling Rinpoche. These are his senior and junior tutors. Ling Rinpoche and Trijayaranji's root guru was Pabaka Rinpoche. Exactly. So Pabaka Rinpoche was, was, is the Dalai Lama's Yuvalama. Lama says, uh, Lin Shuan. Lin So we have to respect Pavoka Rukji, Trijan Rukji, and Lin Rukji very, very much. We can't criticize, we can't think this, we can't think that. Because in all of our sadhanas, whether it's Yamataka, or Hiruka, or Vajrayini, their names are in it. So we'll pray over to your Holiness the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, we request your blessings. Then we have to go to their Lin Shuan, to your Holiness Trijan Rukji, we request your blessings. To your Holiness Lin Rukji, we request your blessings. To your Holiness Pavoka Rukji, we request your blessings. So it's like that. So if you say, oh, this one's not good, but this one's good, then it's a break of the blessing. You can't do that. So my point is, according to Papa Rinpoche, who is the lineage master of all of us, he recommended Vajrayini for all of us. Why? Yamataka, Uyya Samaja, Kala Chakra, all these practices are supreme. And they were the main practices of Lord Sokha for themselves. But to practice those practices, you have to have Lord Tsongkhapa's qualities. If you don't have Lord Tsongkhapa's qualities, you won't be able to practice something like that. Lord Tsongkhapa's quality is he didn't waste time on his body. We're trying to live long, we're trying to keep it healthy, we're trying to keep it going, we're trying to make it all comfortable and very nice. We're always focused on making our body comfortable and happy. 
so that we can live long, so we can be healthy. Lama Tsong Papa lived to about 50 plus and died, but he became a Buddha. We live to 80, we're still in samsara. I'd rather live to 50 and be a Buddha than live to 80 and still be in samsara my next life. So for me, for real Buddhist practitioners, taking care of the body is part of the practice, it's not the practice. It is part of the journey, it is not the end of the journey. So therefore, therefore, Lama Tsong Papa has a lot of patience. Lama Tsong Papa has a lot of patience to study and study and study and master the teachings and understand the teachings. Lama Tsong Papa's focus was not money. Lama Tsong Papa got a lot of money and a lot of offerings from a lot of people, but he wasn't calculative or sneaky or he wasn't um, um, uh, um, miserly with his money. He was extremely generous. Why was he generous? He wasn't attached to it. Why wasn't he attached to it? He had a different focal point. He was very famous. He was very, very famous, very well known throughout the ancient world. But he didn't focus on that. So my point is, Lama Tsong Baba has all these qualities of, of perseverance, endurance, generosity. He has all these qualities to practice all these high deities. You and I don't have the qualities that Lama Tsong Baba has on such a level. Because we don't have the, that practice on such a level. To practice such deities is quite difficult for us. So what happened is a manifestation of all these deities is in the form of Vajrayogini. Vajrayogini has the same qualities as those deities. Same, because a Buddha is a Buddha, but with much less work. Even to hear the name of Vajrayogini, even to hear the name of her practice, or to understand her practice, or to be in the presence to know the practice, you have to have merits. You have to have merits. If you don't have merits, you won't be able to hear it. If you don't have merits, anything having to do with her, you will not be able to be there, or attend, or go near, or have, have any type of interest. Even if you're in the room, you won't be able to stay focused. Your body will take over. Because I have many people in Dharma Talks who cannot focus, who cannot even stay awake when we talk about Dharma. But when they're out of the Dharma, they're very awake. When they're in the Dharma, we've seen in the past students, when they're in the Dharma, immediately they fall asleep, or they can't focus, or something goes wrong, or they become agitated. But when they're out, before and after, no problem. That's a sign of their parents. So therefore, and some people even, they have very strong karma with their guru. They have very strong karma with some teacher, but they, because their observation is very, very strong, their negative karma is very strong. If someone says something immediately, they say, oh no, I'm not going to go to that Dharma anymore. Why? They said this, they said this, they said this. These are all obstacles. Obstacles that manifest from who? From themselves. Why? If a Lama is bad, everybody must see them bad. How come some see people see them good, some people see them bad? That means a Lama is not good or bad, it must be the object. It must be the person who sees them. Bad. Very simple, very logical. So the object itself is not inherently, meaning naturally good or bad, it is the perception of the person according to their karma, their environment. So therefore, the red color of Vajrayogini is specifically to counter desire, lust. Then you think, well, what about anger? What about jealousy? What about miserliness? Oh, it's definitely there. You see, each Buddha, you can't say, oh, Tara has conquered miserliness, but she still has desire. That's why she's greedy. Then Vajrayogini is red, she's conquered desire, but she's overcome jealousy. No, I'm sorry, she's conquered desire, but she still has miserliness. That's impossible also. So why the manifestation? Because Vajrayogini's practice more focuses on destroying all the negative qualities of us via the channel of desire. Tara's practice destroys all the negative qualities in us, focused V-I-A on miserliness. So it's given why all the negative afflictions are connected. They're like that. When you attack this one, it will lead to the destruction of all these. Why? They're connected. One cannot exist without the other. So therefore, when you destroy one, all the others get destroyed. So therefore, in Vajraginis, Vajraginis, this one is more stronger the red. In Tara, this one's more stronger. But if you go this way, you destroy all of this. If you go this way, you destroy all of this. Does everybody understand that? I want to give you a little overview of why. Now, 
the faces of the deities. All right, yeah, the faces of the deities, and how many they have, and their expressions represent a certain affliction we have, represent a certain mood we have, and a certain anger or a certain type of manifestation that we have. And each face, and each color, and each mood counters that one. How many arms a deity has also represents the type of methods the deity uses to counter their problems. Even what the deity holds, the implements, the implements of what the deities hold is the method the deity uses in his or her meditation to counter our problems. Similarly, what the deity steps on what the deity steps on. Sometimes you see deity, other deities, sometimes you see animals, sometimes you see God, sometimes you see demons. What they step on is not what they actually are stepping on. What the deities are stepping on are the type of afflictions and difficulties and problems and obstacles from your karma that this deity will be very effective on stepping on. So what they step on is a clear visual manifestation of your personal obstacles and attachments that they're very good Okay? So, the deity's color and face and hands and arms and implements and their legs are a roadmap to a mind. And the roadmap tells you what method the deity will use for you to be what method? Does everybody understand that? Any questions on that? Hence, because each of our minds are very different, and the way we do things are very different, and the way we manifest our anger, desire, and, and our attachments are very different, the deities have different counter methods. So over time, the deities re-manifest, the Buddhas re-manifest different forms, different sadhanas, different colors, different hands, different positions to counter the prevalent problem, the most prevalent. So today's problem that's very prevalent is desire. So the one that counters that very much is Vakirini. Hence, for our center, in accordance with my guru, can so love sometimes to to my guru in New Jersey. I follow his example. This is my first guru when I was very young. I chose Vakirini for the center. Vakirini is not necessarily my main practice. But I chose it for the center. Why? Because today's time that is most prevalent. Most, most, most prevalent. Right? So when you look at the different deities, you should think which one is more powerful, which one's more effective, which one's more better. Why? That would deduce that one Buddha is more better than the other. That's impossible. But you should think which one is more appropriate for me at this time. That one's a better way to be. Alright? So they have different colors and different faces and different arms and different implements. Why? Because they, uh, they counter certain psychological problems and attachments and difficulties at different periods and different times. So Vajubini's form like this, as Vajubarati was very effective maybe two, three hundred years ago, it's still, if you put her on the altar in that form of worship, it's the same as a Buddha. But now her form is in the form of Naropa Sakini or Naropachu, which manifested recently, in inverted commas recently, which is much more effective for people today. Why? She definitely counters anger. Her face is slightly angry like this. Her face is slightly angry with a smile representing she will counter your anger. Her face is slightly blissful like this. Her face is Two moods, wrath and bliss. Kiroka has four moods, like this. What does it represent? She will counter your desire. Why? Her face is sexual bliss. Her face is sexual bliss. Why? That's what we're after. We're after sexual bliss. So when her face has sexual bliss, it doesn't mean she's in sexual bliss. It doesn't mean that. It means that that's what we want. So therefore, if we do her practice, she will counter the negative qualities that bring you to that negative state. Contaminated bliss. Contaminated, that's the key word. Okay? And her body is red. Her body is red to represent countering our most powerful desire. 
which is, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. She counts as that. Red is desire. I want. The way she stands, like so. The way she stands is a roadmap also. This one represents, she will focus on wisdom, on the wisdom teachings. Mother Tantra, female Tantra, Knight, Yang. Yang is female, right? Yin. Is it yin or yang? Yin. More female. She has male or yang. It's in this way. It's straightforward representing, yes, she practices that, but her focus is this one. Her body is a roadmap. And she's completely naked. Why is she completely naked? Who? Which one of us can run around naked? Which one of us would want to see another person naked? I rest my case. The point of that is she's naked. Why? It's not that her body is beautiful and therefore she's not ashamed. Naked and covering has something to do with the ego. I don't want to look bad. I don't want to appear bad. I don't want to shame myself. I don't want to shame myself. So her being naked means she has no ego. So it's a direct teaching. So how do we manifest no ego? We run around naked? No. The, the Buddhas show that as a sim symbology of what they help us achieve is not a message to you to run around naked. It's not a message to you that naked is good. Why? We, even if you have no ego and you go to Alaska and you're naked, you can die with no ego. What's the point? You go to Siberia with no clothes on. Oh, I have no ego, so I take off my clothes. Ridiculous. So you, the Buddhas are not telling you to run around with no clothes. It's a symbology. And re remember, the Buddhas have to appeal to people who are even uneducated in the past. Today, most people are literate. Last time. So it's easy for them to remember. So therefore, each of the tantric deities, each of the tantric deities have different colors, different look, different appearance, and different faces and different arms. Why? They counter, their specialities are counter a specific type of attachment, a specific type of affliction or problem. Does everybody understand that? If we want to get into their practices deeply, we have to do the foundational practices. We have to be very persevering and enthusiastic and not lazy. We have to do the foundational practices. Then we have to find a guru. For the foundational practices, if you have a guru, it's wonderful. If you don't have a guru, you can pretty much do it on your own. But for tantric practice, there's no end if and but you need a guru. So what happens is, people say, well, I don't need a guru, I'm doing foundational practice. Yes, but you need to cultivate one so that you can get tantric practice. You see, the foundational practice is cultivating a guru. The guru cultivates you, you cultivate the guru. So when you have a long-standing relationship with a guru, and you cultivate that relationship, when they actually give you tantric practice, it's easier for both. So some people say, oh, I don't need a guru. I don't want a guru. I don't have to listen. I can do what I want. I can do as I like. Oh, uh, this is wrong. That's wrong. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not comfortable. They just say, you can say all that. But in tantric practice, you can't. You cannot. So therefore, before tantric practice, when you cultivate a guru, that is the, that is the framework you have to go on. That is the, the thinking that you go on, is that you start cultivating, letting go of your ego, me, 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 cultivating ego business. So that's why in foundational practices, it's very important to have a guru. So during foundational practices, if the guru teaches you things, you're supposed to learn. If the guru gives you practices, you're supposed to do. If the guru explains things to you, you're supposed to take it. Even if the guru becomes angry and tells you off, you're supposed to put your ego down and do it. But simply sitting in front of the guru, respectfully not talking back, is not guru devotion. Doing what the guru said in your Dharma practice is guru devotion. If you year after year don't know anything, you're ridiculous. Today there's a very big, big uh, 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 thing out there about who's your guru. If your guru sits on a big throne with a big audience, with big crowds, big monastery and famous, it's all over the press, or your guru's a nobody. So if your guru's on a big throne and have a lot of people, whatever this guru says is right. Why? Because people are after them. Gurus are not celebrity stars. They're not celebrity stars. Just because they're stars and they're well-known doesn't mean they are more qualified than a guru that's not well-known. Why? There are many talented people in the world who doesn't choose to become famous. 
There are people who are talented more than people on the screen. There are some people who are more talented than people on the screen. They never had black out here. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? That's obstacles. This is what we call obstacles. When we're supposed to get something, get something, and our heart makes it stop. But you need very powerful. Why is it very powerful? Look how difficult it is for you to get it. It's the whole area. Three mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I said put on candles. That's what I just said. Put on candles. Candles. Incredible. Aren't you amazed? It's called obstacle. Obstacle can manifest in us falling asleep. Obstacle can manifest in us having disease or sickness. Obstacle can manifest in us having accidents. Obstacles may manifest in us having anger. Obstacles may manifest in something like this. Why? The purpose is to stop you to receive something good. It's called obstacle. That's why we do dark protective factors. To push the obstacles away. If we don't do Dharma protector practice these days, these days according to my teachers, these days, last time different, very difficult to get Dharma now. Very, very difficult. Good. Something this is not candles. Good. He's telling to put it in front of Rinpoche so he can see. That's why he's signaling there. He thought you were doing a aloha dance. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Now Ben doesn't like you, so he give you a black face. <laughs> Ben's quite cute. Trying to touch me? Oh, Hinton, so, sorry. My, it must be my delusions. <laughs> Well, if you put it in my face, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, put like, is it blinding? I'm like, no, not at all. I can see perfectly through my fingers. No need to talk too much. Just shine some more over there. We can still see it. Yeah, no need to talk too much. Very nice. Okay, now. Is still working, Cynthia? Yes, still working. Can you still see me? Can I see you? Well, why don't you come closer? Okay. Just lift it up and bring it closer. Ah, easier for you. Yeah, put it right there. So. Ah, yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. Oh, just like opening up a show. <laughs> ben, come here. You can put it here, easier for you. You can sit on the chair, Cynthia. Yeah. Okay. No, it's okay, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. He's just gonna move past you. You're just a couple of things. Alright, good. Alright, okay? Yes, okay. Now, what were we talking about before your obstacles stopped all this? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody remember? Any of you four remember? Hmm? I didn't hear you, what you said? No, I asked these four. Anybody remember? JP? I think when, where you left off this with regards to your teachers. Very good. Very, very good. Excellent. My teachers have recommended Vajravini's practice, the majority of them, and their lineage lamas. And the reason is this. Vajravini is not superior to the other deities. Vajravini is not better than the deities, other deities. She's not better than Kuan Yin, and she's not better than, than uh, Guya Samaja or, or Kalachaka. She's not better. She is their equal. But her path that is presented in her meditation is superior. Why is that? Because it deals with current issues. If we looked at a movie made 50 years ago, if we watch a movie that's made this year, which one would be more applicable to us? Most likely the current movie, correct? Why? 
It's about current issues. And even some of the things that they talk about in movies 50 years ago, we won't know what they're talking about. Why? We weren't there. We're not part of that mass culture. Similarly, Bajukini is like a movie that's being played now. Bajukini is a movie being played now. So it's more current. Okay? So what happens is, when we want to enter into any of the higher tantric practices, we must cultivate a guru relationship during the sutra stages. When in the sutra stages we have cultivated a relationship and we're cooperative, and you see the gurus will, as Zongsa Kensei Rinpoche says, you, they are hired assassins on the ego. So when they are hired to assassinate your ego and you resist every minute or you're sneaky or you don't follow or you don't do things, and in front you look good, but in the back you're sneaky about it, how will they assassinate your ego? How will your ego be assassinated? Therefore, Guru devotion is not about outer physical service, it's about your inner transformation. They can use outer methods to transform the inner, but it is for inner. So therefore, the Guru tells you to do this, this, this. You never want to hear the Guru tell you, I told you so. If the Guru tells you, I told you so, it means you didn't do something towards your enlightenment. So if you develop a relationship, if you develop a relationship in the sutra stages with your Guru, when you do tantric practice, it will be very easy. Let me tell you why. Because you'll be cooperative. If in the, ten, in the sutra stages or pre-tantric practices, you're uncooperative with your Guru, you doubt, you run away, you find, you always think something negative, you always um, uh, resist, or you don't want to cooperate, or you think the Guru is trying to take your money away, you think the Guru is trying to cheat you, or trying to lie to you, or trying to do something negative, you always think like that. How will you gain any, any results in a tantra stage? Tantra is even more precarious. So therefore, developing this relationship is very important. And before we even take the person as our guru, we have to check the person out through friends, through others, through speech, through listening, through watching. Today, most people take on a teacher. Most people take on a teacher by observing other students. Why? Today, through the media, through popularity and through fame, the gurus are well known all over and they usually have a lot of disciples, a lot of people. It's very hard to get close to them. Close doesn't mean physical closeness, it means interaction daily. Very hard. So therefore, how do people choose a guru? How do gurus be able to convey dharma to other people? How do gurus' dharma spread or what they're trying to teach spread through the students? If the students are well behaved, well behaved doesn't mean a fake behavior, it means they've been changed and transformed by the Dharma. They speak well because of Dharma. They're more patient than the people they're trying to help. You see, if you're trying to help someone, you have to be better than them. If you're not better than them, how will you help them? How will you help? If you don't know, if you don't know the rituals, you're trying to teach rituals to other people, how are you going to help? If you yourself is very greedy and very miserly, and you're asking other people to donate and donate and donate, they're not going to donate because you're greedy. Even if they don't know that you're greedy, your energy is greedy and your karma is greedy. You don't open up the environmental conditions for wealth to come. Being greedy closes the environmental condition for the person to trigger in their mind generosity. Everybody has generous and, and uh, um, greedy characteristics in their karma. But which one opens depends on the person. So, for example, you, if you're very wealthy and I want you to sponsor books, I want you to sponsor statues, I want to sponsor something. If you know my reputation, I've been giving, I've been helping, I've been giving, I've been helping, and I come here, you feel that, you know that. If I say help, even if you're very greedy, you will help. But if you know myself, I don't give, I'm very tight, I'm manipulative, and you haven't heard me doing anything, and I'm very, very miserly, and I ask you that, you're going to look at me, you won't say it, and you say, well, what are you talking about? You're just trying to save your own money. You will think like that. So that's why people soliciting donations and funds, I have told them many times, you yourself have to be generous and openly, and you yourself have to take a, inverted commas, initial loss. In business, you have to invest first, whether it's going to make it or not, you don't know, right? So if we're going to approach very wealthy people, if you're going to approach very wealthy sponsors, you have to have the karma to convince them. How do you make the karma? You yourself have to be generous. If you are not generous, you will lose your chance with them. When they see you, they will see you otherwise. Why? You yourself don't give. You yourself don't do. You yourself don't share. You yourself is calculative. You're just trying to save your own money. That's what they will think. Whether it's true or not, is a different story. So what happens is when you ask people for funds, they won't listen. Even if they have a very good relationship with you, even if they've been very lovey-dovey with you, 
If you ask them for funds, they will say no or they will avoid you. Why? You cannot open their environmental conditions. You cannot. So if you yourself is always tight, calculative with food or whatever, if you yourself is always selfish and you make excuses to cover not to be generous, you can forget about raising funds. You can forget about it. And in today's Dharma, we can't hang out in a village and, and build grass temples, grass hut temples. We need to expand. It's very important to be generous. Similarly, if our, we ourselves, if we ourselves don't practice harmony, if we ourselves don't practice cooperation, we ourselves don't manifest cooperation and harmony, how can we be in an institution that teaches that to others? How can we be? If we ourselves don't practice harmony, if we ourselves quote the Dharma all the time, oh, the Buddha says like that, oh, the Buddha's like that, Dharma like that, why are you like that, why are you like that, why are you like that? You yourself is like that. That's why people around you are like that, because they don't respect you. They don't respect you. So if you want to quote the Dharma, you better make sure you're near Buddha. If you're just like me and you, we'll have to be very careful in quoting the Dharma. Why? You become a fanatic. A fanatic is someone, fanatic is someone that doesn't practice, they just talk. So if you want, if you want, if you want to quote Dharma, you have to be double better the person you're quoting Dharma to. Double better. If you're not double better the person, then it's very difficult for you to quote Dharma. And some more, you will chase people away. Because people look at you and say, but you know the Dharma so well, you've been Dharma so long, why like that? Immediately. That's the most famous question in Malaysia. Why like that? Why like that? Then what do you do? Like an ostrich hides your head under the ground? So therefore, if we want to practice the Dharma, if we want to spread the Dharma, if we want to bring Dharma to others, if we want to, if we want to, we have to have the energy to influence others. That energy can only come by daily practice. That daily practice can only come by contemplating on the importance of Dharma. If we don't contemplate on the importance, it's very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Very hard. So therefore, all the Buddhas, in all the tantras, and all the teachings, talk about mind transformation. In sutra, it's more subtle. In tantra, it's more overt. The manifestation of the teaching, I'm not talking about the teaching. Teaching on both sides is the same. The manifestation of the teaching is different. So therefore, tantra deities, tantra deities, from their side, koran sumunes, from their side, they're exactly the same. How they manifest is different to fit the aptitude and the psychological makeup of the people they're trying to bless. Okay, does everybody understand that? Everybody understand that? Hence the difference. So when you say, I like simply Buddha Shakyamuni and I don't like the complicated tantric deities, you make yourself look quite silly. A real practitioner a real practitioner, a high practitioner, would never say things like that. That is a sign of a person who doesn't know the tantras or doesn't know practice. Why? They always say they want simple, simple, simple. It's not they want simple, they're lazy. I've heard that many times, over and over, hundreds of times. Oh, I'm not interested in that practice. I'm not, I just want my life simple. I want my practice simple. I want my uh, uh, prayers simple. It's not that they want it simple. They're too lazy. Why? Everything in their life is not simple. They made so many complications with kids, they made so many complications with cars, with, with money, with women, with business. And we're willing to go through so much complications for all that. But for our Dharma practice, we want it simple. It's not we want it simple. We want a shortcut and we want it, we're lazy. Why we don't know the benefits? Most of us, I can say almost everybody in, our, in this room, at one time or another in our lives, we engage in very complicated things. Very complicated. But when it comes to yidams or dharma practice or practice, we want it simple. We don't have much time. We don't have much energy. We don't have much um, 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 intelligence. But that's all an excuse. So when people tell me they want things simple, I, in, if, if, they're, if they're someone that can take it, I tell them, no, you don't. You're just lazy. If they're not able to take it inside, I think to myself, oh, they're just like me. I'm lazy too. Now I know. I used to say that too. So I think, uh-oh, another close friend. <laughs> Another person that says whatever I've been saying and I've been hiding. So, so what's the answer here? To go for the most complicated deities? No. No. You go for whatever deity your, your, your teacher has given you. Whatever you have started. Once you start, you go all the way. Go all the way with it. So whether you meditate on Shakyamuni, 
whether you meditate on someone complicated like uh, Yamataka, complicated but fabulous, it's all the same. Because if you look at Shakyamuni's one face and two arms and two legs, it has exact meaning of Yamataka's nine faces, 34 arms and 16 legs. If you look at Yamataka's nine faces, 30, uh, nine faces, 34 arms and 16 legs, all the meanings condensed in Shakyamuni's one face and two arms. So whether which data you look at, you're gonna have to know more. For people like me, I find Yamataka or Vajigini easier than Shakyamuni. Why? They openly display the teachings of the path on their hands, on their color, on their body, on their pose, on their implements. Openly. It's like Vajigini and Yamataka, it's like they're holding a signboard. This way to enlightenment. Why? Whatever they're holding, whatever their color, whatever their implements, point clearly to different facets of enlightenment. Whereas Shakyamuni is not holding any hand signs. You have to memorize it. Why do you have to memorize it? He looks just like us. Do you understand that, Paris? He looks like Actually, so tantric deities are a little more exciting in a way of they have more road signs to enlightenment. Does that make sense? So people say, oh, it's so complicated. They're so colorful. There's so many faces. And they're so fierce. They're so kind. They're so kind. Yamataka is very kind to show yourself with, himself with a buffalo head and, and chance to, the, the chance that you might run away from fear. Buddha, didn't, Buddha Shakyamuni didn't take as many chances as Yamataka. He looks nice, he just attracts you. But Yamataka is quite brave. And Vajigini is even more braver. Where in the world would a naked, beautiful lady run around and, and, uh, and command respect? Certainly not. Imagine, imagine you brought a beautiful lady home naked and introduced your mother. She said, no, <laughs> you better find somebody else. Imagine that. Imagine in China, a beautiful naked lady walks around. Or imagine in, in Iraq. A beautiful naked lady walks around. Cannot. So what's my point? My point is, Vajrakini is even more daring than Shakyamuni. I say that in respect. Why? She shows you the path openly. So tantric deities are very interesting because they show us the path to enlightenment with their body color, with their face, with their stance, with their facial expression, with their eyes, with the number of hands, with their implements, what they're stepping on, and their pose. Even the mudra of their hand. Does everybody understand that? Okay, I want you guys to remember that. I want you guys to please think about that. So that when other people ex talk to you about that, you're able to explain. And some of us here really, really want to make the Dharma spread. Some of us here really, really love the Dharma. And some of us really want to collect merit. We know the meaning of Dharma. So we go work in the outlets. Some of us here. Some of us have to be pushed and reminded to work in the outlets. But when we work in the outlets, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to spread the Dharma because that's when we're tested on what we know. They say, but I don't know much. Exactly. A test doesn't mean what you know. It's also a test on what you don't know and what you need to find out. So people think, oh, I don't know a lot. I work in a Dharma store. That's exactly why you should work in a Dharma store, because you don't know a lot. Oh, I know a lot. All right, work in a Dharma store. Either way, you should. Why? A test is not a test of what you know. It's also a test of what you don't know. There are some people with very big egos. Very big egos, they don't want to be tested on what they don't know, so they hide from the, from the uh, outlets. Some of them, I've asked them to work in the outlets. They fail, they don't push, they don't talk. I've seen them, you know, the stores like that. The customers come here, they go here. The customers come here, they go here. The customers come here, they go here. I watched them on the webcam. I saw that. And they don't sell anything, they don't talk, they don't do anything. Why? Because they're afraid to be asked something they don't know, and they don't want to be wrong. And that's a beautiful test for us, because why? That's all the reason why we should do it. That's all the reason why. And the more we escape from it, we fail in everything else in our life because it's all connected. If we work in a lajang, if we work outside, if we work in a, a Dharma institution, we will fail and make mistakes all the time because we're afraid to be tested. Why are we afraid to be tested? We're too lazy to learn. So the time gets passed away. So Dharma outlets is a wonderful place for us to be tested. Tested by who? Ourselves. Ourselves. It's very, very powerful for collecting merit. So in any case, today, we're going to be doing a gospel ceremony, and some of you have incredible obstacles. Incredible. This has never happened before. Never. Some of you here have incredible obstacles, and the obstacles hold by the darkness, and by the heat, and by no fan, and the mosquitoes <laughs> will make you uncomfortable and make you give up. And that's called obstacles. Why are they obstacles? Obstacles manifest according to the way we fear the most. For some of us, we fear ghosts. Heat, never mind. For some of us, we fear heat. We haven't let go. But we don't fear ghosts. 
so the obstacles manifest to us in the most powerful way that can stop us from doing things. That can stop us. So therefore, you come for a gakko ceremony. A gakko ceremony is this. It's very short and sweet. Very short. It's the Lama doing the meditation. You guys actually just sit back, relax, and you know, enjoy the air conditioning and, and the beautiful fan. <laughs> <laughs> the Lama does the meditation and the work. So there's usually a lot of obstacles for Gakko. Usually for any tantric practice, this one is according to Jigun Ruji. So, someone would have cultivated a relationship with their Guru by service, out of service according to the 50 verses of Guru devotion. They would cultivate a cleaning, washing, sweeping, serving, cooking, listening to a Guru and cultivated their confidence. Then the Guru has, has confidence in his students and in the students with offerings from their heart, any material offerings from their heart offers their Guru a request for initiation. And that's after years of developing and cultivating a relationship with the Guru. And then the Guru accepts and the Guru confers initiation upon the disciple. After the Guru confers initiation upon the disciple, in the case of Vajjagini, then the Guru has a responsibility to teach the paths, the meditation, and the practices of Vajjagini to the disciple. When he teaches, some of the item is not written. It's called oral transmission. Some is not written. There are some teachings not allowed to be written, must be transferred from mouth to ear. Cannot be written down. Because if it's so secret or so esoteric that if it's written down and ri um, studied by the wrong person, it can have detrimental effects. Detrimental. For example, some of these reality shows, they always tell the kids, you don't do this, it's from years of practice. The person has done this for many, many years. So it may look easy on film, but actually hanging off a cliff looks very easy on film, but you don't do it because they went through years of practice, right? Same thing in Tantra. Tantra is not dangerous, it's dangerous for the person who hasn't practiced. Why, if they do it wrong, not the deities punish you. So it's like a reality show, make sense? Okay, like that, that's why Tantra is secret. People say, what's the secrecy? Why we can't talk, why can't, and why, 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 what's all that? That's the reason. Clear yet, because you're right. Be, you, why I ask you? Because you're right. Then you can benefit many people when you get knowledge. Many people. And that's what I want to give you, knowledge. So, after you receive initiation, after you, you receive initiation, you have to take on vows. Vows that constrict and restrict you from doing things that increase your ego. And then you have a set set of prayers and meditations and invocations and offerings. Offerings are very important. Offerings are very important because they help you to collect a vast amount of merit in a short amount of time. So the offerings being set correctly, the offerings being set correctly according to Tantra of that deity, each offering has a psychological imprint on your mind to transform some aspect of your mind. Some aspect. Example, this one, this one transforms your attachment to smells and pleasant smells. This one transforms your view and your perception of what you see. So some people always see negative things. They always see negative things in other things. They always pick up negative things. Making the offering of light in tantric practice helps you to transform wrong view to correct view and to view things well. And also, this one helps you to actually have create the karma to be able to com communicate with the, Dharma, with the Buddhas directly. So making offerings is very important and Beautiful cups of the highest quality, most expensive quality, and items of the most beautiful quality, and it's clean and it's set out correctly and perfectly, is an offering to the Buddhas to invoke upon them to receive transformation of your five senses. So when we make the offerings correctly, it helps us to plant seeds for that. And why is it of the highest material? It's of the highest material in order to collect more merit to be able to do more without obstacles. Some people are very stingy, very, very stingy. Their stinginess is an obstacle. Very important. And if you say, well, my altar is very small, I found a new trick. That is to give away statues, give away offering items, give away pictures, give away kankas. Why? They practice and worship and make offerings. I collect them there. Isn't that sneaky? So for those of us who really, really want to advance, you give statues away, you give tatsas away, you give pictures away, you print books, you make offerings, you give offering items to others, you encourage people to make offerings. Why? 
Each time they do it, each time they do it, you collect the merit and they collect the merit. So if you give the statues away to 500 people, there are 500 people out there making offerings that be collecting merit. Just think. So I just sit there and sleep in my room and watch DVDs, and they're doing the offerings. I collect the merit, they collect the merit. Isn't that wonderful? It sounds like it sounds like a joke, but it's really like that. So people who know that. They really give, they're very generous to give things away. So actually, like the Dalai Lama says, if you want to be selfish, be smart selfish. Be smart selfish. If you want to be selfish, don't be stupid selfish. That's why high lamas give things away. That's why high lamas always are very generous. Why? They know what brings real value to others and themselves. Small lamas, they're very miserly. Small lamas like me and you, very miserly. Very selfish, very calculative, don't want to give, don't want to share. Why? Because we don't know the value of giving and sharing. We don't know the value of making offerings. So when we make offerings, when we learn the sadhana, we learn the precise meditational rituals. And what's incredible is this. Okay, listen very carefully. I'm going to reveal another little secret some people have heard before. When you get the Vajugini sadhana, in Vajugini's practice, it's very profound because it teaches you how to die. It teaches you how to enter the bardo. It teaches you how to take rebirth. Literally, it gives you the exact meditation on how to die, how to take, how to enter the intermediate state bardo, and how to take rebirth. Even what to visualize. You get a complete control over your future lives. That is a manual you're getting. No one on this planet can give you something that great. No one. They can teach you how to make money, you leave it at that. They can teach you how to get a beautiful wife, you gotta leave it at that. Maybe she leaves you when she finds a beautiful boy. <laughs> right, see you later. And um, they can give you a beautiful car, but that one turns old real fast. Or if you're like Cha, very fast. So what happens is, is all these things can be taken away, but the control of death and rebirth, every single life you have control. That's why some of these high Tibetan lamas, they can tell you where, when they're going to die, like Song Rinpoche. They can tell you where they're going to take rebirth. They can even tell you the parents' name of their next name, very accurately, and the location. They can tell you why. They've mastered this practice. And the incredible thing about them is they want to share this practice with you, but you have to go through the preliminary practice. Preliminary practice is not a test of them and you. It's not like the Chinese seafoods. They want to test your endurance. So they beat you, they torture you, they do all kinds of things before they teach you their Kung Fu style. In Tibetan Buddhism, they torture you or they make you do things for you to collect merit to prepare yourself. It's very different. The, the style looks the same. Then after you receive it, you have to do actual retreats. You have to do the practice every day. You do the practice every day, you do the retreats, you hold your commitment. Then, for example, in Yamataka or in Vajugini's Tantra, you have a text called Gakho. Gakho is actually an exorcism test, a, a text. Exorcism. It is to exercise spirits. It is to expel spirits. It is to bless spirits. It is to talk to spirits and tell them don't harm. They're collecting negative harm. It is also to stop sudden death. It is also to stop sudden afflictions. It is also to stop negative thought or disturbances for the night when we're trying to sleep. So people who have insomnia that is sleep, I'm sorry, spirit induced. This text is very powerful to stop them. But to do this text, you have to have the practice and the balance. To do that, you have to also receive the initiation to have that, you have to have a guru. So you don't just simply take the text, start reading will be not as effective. Not as effective. So there's a lot of things. So when a Lama does something for you, you have to understand that Lama has done a lot of things to be able to do that for you. Quite a lot of things. It's not so simple. So therefore, we always say, how kind a Lama is. I'm not trying to indirectly refer to myself. I'm telling you actually what it is. How kind a Lama is. How kind of Lama is even to call me and do the Gakko ritual for me? How kind? Because how many years of preparation he had to give and sacrifice to be able to do that for me? How kind of Lama is? In that way we gain faith and confidence again. So therefore, gain confidence and faith in what? In the Lama? Maybe more in compassion. That there is compassion. There are people who do things out for us out of compassion. Then, the Gakko ritual is very excellent for stopping spirits that are related to meridian points of the earth. There are meridian points in the earth. And on those meridian points around the world, people have built Stonehenge, 
people have built uh, places like um, um, the pyramids. So those are meridian points where people are, and there are some meridian points in the world where actually if you go there, you put rocks there, it levitates because the magnetic point there is not something magical and mystical, you know, right? So what happens is there's meridian points in the earth, and through those meridian points, there are deities that travel, negative deities or just earth deities. And sometimes when we step on them, that point, and they're passing through, we can get epileptic things. Okay, there are many, many types of disturbances and problems, many times. So Gakpo stops them. So once we do Gakpo, once we do Gakpo, why doesn't the problem stay away? Very simple, let me give you an analogy. When you go to the gym, you work out for a few weeks. Then you go on vacation, you stop. And then you pick out what happens to your body. It goes back to the way it was before the gym, right? So all that effort's wasted. So on that principle, kind of like Gakko. So even when you do Gakko, you get temporary relief. But that temporary relief is temporary because it comes from an outer source, your Lama or his practice, not your practice. If the Lama does Gakko to you, that means his practice is effective. If the Lama does Gakko to you, if the Lama does Gakko to you and you receive the results, it means that his practice is effective. He is doing his practice. But if you yourself are not doing it, the problems will come back again and again and again. Why is that? Because the problem is not from the Lama, it's from you. So similarly, if you go to a doctor for an ailment or a problem, right? If you go to a doctor, your problem will go away as long as you follow the treatment. If you don't follow the treatment, you go off, you have to go back to the doctor again. Then you have to go back again. Similarly, you're always dependent on the doctor. So when you go for a Lama for Gakko, and the Gakko is effective, and it's help, it's proof to you that the Lama is doing his practice. The Lama is doing his commitments or her commitments. And it's proof to you that you're not doing yours. You're not doing yours and you don't have any powers, you don't know anything, you can't do anything. Why? If you can, you don't need it. So that one should be an experience we meditate and say, oh. Instead of being embarrassed and lose face, we should turn around and say, oh, I will do more practice. It's a teaching for me. Oh, wonderful, thank you. It's a self-teaching. And we thank ourselves for having the comments to receive it. So therefore, God is very important. In some cases, in some cases, no, not in some cases, in all cases, the Gakpo plants seeds of that particular deity in a person's mind. What do seeds mean? Seeds means when it's planted in that person's mind, in the future, when the environmental cause is correct, that person will be able to practice that deity. So also doing Gakpo for people is very powerful because the ultimate reason is to become a Buddha. How? To plant seeds of Vajrayuni in our mind. Does everybody understand that? So that's basically what a Gakpo ritual is. I gave you a background on it. I gave you an explanation about it. And also, also, I gave you an explanation of why the deities manifest because it's related to the tantric deities. Because some people get confused or they don't understand about tantric deities. And people around here, once you explain, they're all right because they're educated. It's just explanation. So therefore, um, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to do the Gakpo ritual. And while I'm doing the Gakpo ritual, it's very good to think of the Lama as the actual tantric deity that's doing the ritual for you. So it doesn't matter that if the deity is female and the Lama is male or vice versa. Because we're not talking about the outer appearance of the Lama or the outter appearance of the deity. We're talking about the inner nature of the or a Buddha. Okay? And while we're doing the ritual, you don't have to do anything. You just sit comfortably and just relax and you just listen. Alright? And in this ritual, it's very important for you to visualize a small Vajrayogini on the top of your head. So even those who are not directly involved with Gak Gakpo, even if you're in a room, it's very beneficial. You can do the same visualization. Very, very beneficial. Alright? So visualize a small thumb sized Vajrayogini. <coughs> In front of you. Okay, on top of your head. I like a very powerful security guard. Very powerful. Nobody can get you. In the world, we run around with security guards, but they can still shoot us. Look at some of the presidents. But Vajrini is even better. We have men in black. Vajrayogini is a woman in red, so that's even better, more powerful. So we can visualize her on top of our heads, very carefully, alright? Okay.